Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Porcelli, and I'm an assistant dean in Hofstra University's School of Health Professions and Human Services. Thank you all so much for being in attendance with us this evening for the fourth installment of our signature event series, The State of Hope, Healthcare Opportunities and Policy Exchange. This evening's event will focus on reopening New York and the region, specifically speaking about COVID-19 testing and contact tracing. This evening's event, as with all State of Hope events, are facilitated by Honorable Kemp Hannon. Senator Hannon is Hofstra's Health Policy Fellow and joined the School of Health Professions and Human Services in April 2019. Shortly thereafter, he created the State of Hope series with the intent to bring to Hofstra's campus discussion about health policy on hot button and important topics. Senator Hannon served as a New York State Senator for 30 years prior to joining Hofstra University's School of Health Professions and Human Services, and he had a very successful and long-lasting impact on legislation throughout the state, but specifically is known for his impact on healthcare within the state and our region. It's now my pleasure to introduce to all of you the panelists who will be speaking tonight. Presented in the order that they will be speaking, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Kathy Gallo. Dean Gallo is the Dean and a professor at the Hofstra Northwell School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies. She is also Executive Vice President and Chief Learning Officer at Northwell Health. Professor Martine Hackett is an Associate Professor in the Department of Health Professions. She is also the Program Director for the Master of Public Health Program in the School of Health Professions and Human Services at Hofstra University. Kathleen Blaney is the Director of Disease Control and Emergency Preparedness in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. She is also the Deputy Lead for New York City's contact tracing efforts. And Michael Balboni. Michael Balboni is the Managing Partner of Redland Strategies and is also a former New York State Senator. Michael was also the first chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee and served as Deputy Secretary for Public Safety for New York State for a number of years. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services, Dr. Holly Syrup. Dr. Syrup has been a fixture of leadership on Hofstra University's campus for over 35 years. Dean Syrup first began ascending leadership positions within the Division of Campus Life. Dean Syrup has, for, has served in past roles such as the Executive Dean of Students and Vice President for Campus Life before joining the faculty in the Department of Counseling and Mental Health Professions in 2006. Dr. Syrup has since earned her full professorship and came back into administration in 2015 when she began her tenure as the Vice Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services and currently serves as the Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Under her current tenure, our school has seen our enrollment grow by over 60%. Our undergraduate retention is at 88%. And the number of programs at the graduate level that we have been offering has steadily increased over time. Without further ado, I will stop my screen share and ask Dean Syrup to welcome us. Thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everyone. And whether you are in your living room, at your kitchen table, or in your home office for this program, we welcome you to our virtual community at Hofstra University. And thank you so much for joining us at our fourth program in the State of Hope series. Uh, as Tony mentioned, the State of Hope was created to provide an outlet for the community to come together to discuss contemporary issues in health and the impact on policy. 
And of course, a special thank you to those in attendance and those on our panel who have served as frontline workers and public health advocates during this time. We applaud and thank you for your work as it really informs us on best practice and will guide practice and policy well into the future. And before we begin the program tonight, I'd like to take a moment to recognize that we are currently facing three major crises, the pandemic, economic issues, and civil unrest. And while different, they each have serious health implications. And sadly, they all expose the continuing problem of injustice, inequality, and structural and systemic racism. In a statement put out by ASPPH, which stated, in the end, achieving a more just world depends on more than statements and slogans. We each need to do our part to take a stand against these injustices and to work and advocate for human rights, social justice, and health equity for everyone, everywhere. And we can begin tonight. As we explore reopening New York and the region, we must continue to consider the impact on our most vulnerable populations. Initially, we were called upon to do our part to meet our goal of defeating this virus, which we hope has made us stronger and a more empathic community. Going forward, as we reopen, we are called upon to address the very real social determinants of health and health disparity. I'd like to thank our panel of experts who have been so generous with their time to share their experience, knowledge, and insight on how best to reopen New York. I look forward to hearing from our panel this afternoon and learning about vital information about best practice measures and metrics that we will follow to evaluate to successfully reopen. And now it's my honor to introduce, well, he's been introduced, but uh, Kemp Hannon, our health policy fellow in the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Kemp did join HPHS in April 2019 after the, his distinguished career in the New York State Senate, where he had a reputation for working across party lines to put the health and well being of others in the forefront. Kemp's career in public service mirrors our school's mission to create a more equitable world for all by educating future leaders to work in clinical, policy, research, and advocacy in healthcare settings. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor, usually, but now screen over to Kemp Hannon. Thank you, Deacon Sear. Appreciate that. Thank you for all the preparation of this. Thank you for Assistant Dean Porcelli for uh, helping with all of the arrangements. When we started uh, a few weeks ago, and knowing that the uh, unexpected turns and twists that come on with the pandemic uh, would make us to be uh, very agile uh, in regard to the topic and the speaking, we never thought we would have to go through uh, the distressing racial unrest, the murder of George Phillips, um, which has now set a whole new stage for how we work in the community for health, for mental health. Um, with that being said, though, we have just want to focus on what we're doing in regard to the reopening of the region. Uh, Long Island has achieved uh, stage one. Um, New York is stage, I'm sorry, Long Island is stage two. New York is stage one. Um, and the amount of testing has uh, uh, driven, gone f higher and higher. Long Island's now up to about 11,000 tests per day. And um, uh, New York City is, is hopefully over 25, uh, 35,000 tests per day. Some of the, um, um, some of the um, slides that the governor used today, I think are instructive because it gives an indication of the focus, what we're uh, doing is changing to uh, the testing and then the positives that come about from that testing and using, he wants to use those as markers for continuing to progress in terms of phases, uh, continuing to uh, uh, look at where we're going to go and re read whether or not we have hotspots. And, uh, and then uh, the, last, the last slide I used today was just looking at some of the other states, which gives us reason um, to be wary of how quickly we can move ahead. Um, Dean Porcelli, do you have the, those slides that you can put onto the screen? There we go. Simply, simply uh, comparing where we were uh, just a short while ago and where we were um, yesterday. Um, 
here's here's the point. Um, this is what uh, drives the administration of New York State right now worried. Uh, things where the rate of uh, COVID is still increasing. Um, Arizona, very sharply up. Uh, their health commissioner yesterday said to their um, uh, all their hospitals plan for an emergency. They're, they're starting to get 100% um, uh, occupied. Texas, since the reopening, they've gone up. California and Florida the same way, even though Florida had been um, seemingly blessed for a long while. With all of that, um, how does New York go forward from where we are? It's, it's, it's the contact testing. And uh, what is it? How does it go? And how does somebody start to work to open up um, a large institution such as Hofstra University or a large business? And that's why we wanted to start out with Dean Gallo, um, to, to, who is not only uh, working on regard to the, the, the education school, but has been um, advising, um, advising uh, the entire administration the steps to take um, as to how to safely open a university combining any number of distant learning and in present learning um, to the extent that it's possible. So, uh, Dean Gallo, I'd like to introduce you, ask you to say a few words. Not only are you full professor at Hofstra, running the School of Nursing, opening a School of Nursing, but um, there's a very uh, euphemistic uh, thing that you have of Chief Learning Officer at Northwell. And people have no idea of the intense um, academic experience that people at Northwell can do, the teaching that's there. You are a degree-granting institution, advanced degrees. So uh, with all of your expertise and practical management skills, I um, ask you to give us some insights. Sure. Thank you, um, Senator Hannon. Um, with all that education and all that uh, insight I'm supposed to have, um, the coronavirus is a challenge for all of us. And across the country, there was quite an in-depth discussion um, throughout the university and college world about when to open, how to open, if to open. So at Hofstra, uh, of course, waiting on the governor's guidance, we've been working for almost six weeks, putting a very robust um, plan in place to open the campus safely. Now, my, one of my jobs was to develop the testing plan. And uh, also under the purview of the nursing school is our student health center. And so the student health center um, will be the, the main um, organization leading the effort around testing. So we put a very, not knowing what the government is going to require, we put a very flexible plan together. If we did every person that stepped foot on campus initially, so we have initial testing, surveillance, and of course, always having the viral testing available for anybody that is symptomatic. But if the initial testing, if we're um, asked to test everybody, staff, faculty, and students, let's do about 13,000 people. And so we put a, a flexible plan that we could do that. Uh, we have the staff ready to do that. We have resources. We have a supply chain um, all set up that we would have uh, appropriate PPE staff trained in. Uh, we're making the assumption that um, we will be using the test that we're using right now, the most reliable test. So that would be what they call the PCR test, the deep nasal pharyngeal swab testing. Um, if the rapid test, they come out with one that's more uh, reliable and um, it's recommended. Uh, we're using a lot of expertise from Northwell Health, we will go there. But in the interim, it will be the PCR testing. So all of that is in place right down to the operational plans in the facility, exactly how to do that. Um, and then we have a 
plan for isolation for those that are positive that we're working with our other colleagues at um, Hofstra with. And then of course, any positives, we contact our local and state Department of Health for contact tracing, contact tracing to be done collaboratively. Um, so I think one thing that's important when you're thinking about how do you open up a big organization, uh, it can't be done in a silo. That you need to have community partners, um, planning for attainment, shoring up a good supply chain and staying ahead of it, but it have too much than too little. Um, so you can always anticipate your burn rate on PPE plus the supplies and equipment. Um, reconfiguring facilities, um, making sure that plans for a room that perhaps held 100 at one time can no longer hold 100. Have, everything is being worked out so that as soon as we know we can open, we have everything ready to go. Training of staff is key, uh, updating policies and procedures. And this, this isn't something that, you know, if we wait till January, we'll be good. We won't have to worry about it. We need to plan for a safe, healthy environment in the COVID world. And that's exactly, um, exactly what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, you're, you, you also have the medical school that's been given permission to open on June 22nd, as all right. medical schools in the state have been. Have they taken any specific steps at the moment? Um, so there's two pieces to that. Over at Northwell, we have our Center for Learning and Innovation. And that is where both the medical school and the nursing school and the PA program go to do their high fidelity simulation, their clinical skills session, so there's a lot of curriculum that is actually executed um, on, uh, at Northwell Health at the Center for Learning and Innovation. So we have put already um, the social distancing policy, um, the facility has been restructured to um, handle the students as they come in, et cetera. We will, um, you know, again, if, the, if it's required, we will test the medical students separately um, at any point in time that they're ready uh, to be tested. Let's go over to Professor Martin. Um, the history of public health has been testing. One of the, probably because a lot of it's confidential, not uh, well publicized. Uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of background and where do you think it's going? Then we'll come back to maybe how it can be carried out uh, uh, culturally and sensitively. Thank you so much, Senator Hannon. Right. <laughs> uh, let me start again. Thank you so much, Senator Hannon. And um, uh, so let me give you all a little bit of background about when we talk about the steps towards reopening. One of the metrics certainly was the idea of test hospitalizations and testing, but another important piece is um, contact tracing. So the uh, even the availability of an appropriate number of contact tracers was sort of the bottleneck that we had in Nassau and Suffolk County in order for us to just to meet to meet phase one. So when it comes to this idea of contact tracing, I want to suggest that what we are talking about is not anything uh, that's new, but it might be helpful to just give um, everybody a little bit of some definitions. So contact tracing is really, think of it as detective work. Think of it as these, as disease detectives who are um, tracking down the, and interviewing people who have been diagnosed uh, with any kind of contagious disease. And so the idea is, is that if you have test positive for contagious disease, you have very likely been able to spread that to other people if, if you didn't know that you were positive for it. So the idea is, is that these um, uh, people are tested positive. They're asked who they've been in contact with recently, then that, um, uh, the, those uh, individuals are then contacted by uh, generally the health department to see 
do they have symptoms? How are they feeling? And they need to then get tested and to see whether or not they are positive with the um, disease, the, the infectious disease. Contact tracers often have a script that is uniform across all different um, test uh, contact tracers um, so that the information that's gathered is uniform and able to um, be put into a, a database uh, to be monitored and tracked. This is a way that you can look at uh, or think about what it would look like for um, the steps along contact tracing. Once a lab um, positively identifies someone with, uh, in this case, COVID-19, um, they are then, uh, their information is then given to the contact tracers who then will call them and ask them who have they been in contact with uh, in particular over 14 days. As we know, 14 days is the incubation period for COVID-19. So the idea is, is that um, at minimum, this is who that they would have um, potentially infected. Once they get that contact information, phone numbers, um, uh, other kinds of contact information from uh, about who they've been in contact with, um, they are then notified, interviewed if they are um, feeling symptoms or test positive, then they need to isolate and quarantine themselves. And this then continues on throughout the other um, uh, contacts. And so the contact tracers are um, literally keeping in touch with the people who have been infected and with the people that they have been in contact with. As we mentioned, contact tracing is not something that's new. Contact tracers are employed by city, state, and uh, health departments, and also um, globally. Um, these disease detectives, not only we know about them, we're hearing a lot about them more in uh, the case of this particular infectious disease, but uh, again, for decades, they have been um, tracing uh, sexually transmitted infections, HIV, uh, more, most recently when there was a measles outbreak in New York State, um, contact tracers were used to be able to try to connect the dots of who had, might have potentially been infected. And um, uh, one of the most successful ways that contact tracers have been used in public health is um, for tu tu tuberculosis control around the world. Um, and so one of the things that I would also add that is um, sort of embedded within the concept of contact tracing is that not only are they kind of keeping track who's sick, who's isolating, but they can also provide supervising treatment and social needs and services of those who then have to isolate. Um, the idea of being able to make sure that people get um, treatment needed is, um, was particularly true for um, tuberculosis in that um, uh, uh, contact tracers and other health department uh, officials actually would observe uh, in person to make sure that those affected were taking their medicine. I want to just suggest that contact tracing is not just about, you know, making phone calls and, you know, taking down some notes. Um, it actually is a, quite a specialized skill. As we can imagine, um, the patient confidentiality is a key piece of this um, and being able to keep that information confidential without uh, uh, violating HIPAA or other kinds of confidentiality regulations. Uh, also, in addition, this you can imagine that somebody who is talking to somebody about um, these um, very sensitive issues needs to have good interpersonal cultural sensitivity and interviewing skills so that they can build and maintain trust with the people that they are contacting and those uh, subsequent contacts. So we have to imagine that the skills that a contact tracer needs are not only organizational, but also that to be able to um, deal with crisis, to deal with the needs that come up, and also to be able to understand the cultural uh, backgrounds that different people might come from so that they can, uh, again, uh, provide uh, appropriate services and ways of talking and understanding and making sure that people basically follow what it is they're supposed to do. Again, when we think about reopening and um, not just going from phase two to phase four, but as Dean Gallo mentioned, this sort of ongoing COVID world that we will be in, we have to recognize that contact tracing will not go away. Um, that contact tracing needs to be a constant surveillance in order for us to maintain lower levels of um, the spread of the disease. So we know that um, Governor Cuomo was looking for um, uh, to hire uh, very quickly a whole bunch of contact tracers. But I also want to point out a couple of things that I noticed just in terms of the job postings um, that for contact tracers. So, um, and taking uh, into consideration what I had just mentioned about the idea that when we're talking about contact tracing, that there are actually a variety of skill sets that are required. 
I want to point out in this New York City contact tracer um, job description under required or desired competencies, you see here the ability to understand the concepts of institutional and structural racism and bias, demonstrated commitment to supporting and working with communities who have experienced systemic oppression and bias. So that's very specific, right? And a very, um, you know, uh, interesting that this is a particular um, requirement for this position. And um, I would suggest that it's probably wise to be able to put these kinds of requirements in there in that um, the reality of this job would uh, require one to be um, uh, um, knowledgeable about these topics. I contrast this with the um, posting for the contact tracers for New York State and Long Island, um, where again you see, you know, good attitude, interpersonal skills, organizational skills, good judgment, but really no other mention of the sort of other skills, the soft skills that might um, uh, that would certainly play a role in a contact tracer being successful in their job. And I would just, you know, going to wrap up by sort of uh, identifying what I see as some concerns um, as we reopen and, as I mentioned, as contact tracing continues. Um, on Long Island, in both Nassau and Suffolk County, we know that Black residents died two and a half times the rate that of white residents. All of the communities with the highest number of positive cases in both Nassau and Suffolk County are communities of color. And it's likely that coronavirus is going to um, will uh, spread in these communities of color, um, in part because of the living conditions, people being in close proximity, uh, the employment categories, people being more uh, essential workers, and the lack of protective equipment. So with that being said, we have to recognize that there are also other concerns um, that when our testing does happen in local communities, um, that they actually have higher infection rates that there are also concerns around um, bias and uh, treatment of uh, Black families uh, during the pandemic, during the height of the pandemic, and that this um, uh, mistrust and bias did not go away uh, just with the decreasing number of positive um, cases. And we also argue that the, um, uh, as the unemployment has reached historic highs, that um, Black residents have been more disproportionately affected. And so taking that all that into consideration, I just sort of leave us with um, some additional questions um, that uh, we should uh, all keep in mind when we talk about contact tracing. Certainly questions about trust within the most severely affected communities. How are people going to get through? How are you going to build that level of trust? What are the services you're gonna connect people to? If someone is told to isolate for 14 days, where are they gonna get food? How are they gonna be able to um, get other kinds of support that, that are needed? Um, what about um, other needs that might be discovered as you continue that contact with them? Their job loss, mental health needs, payments with rent and housing. And finally, I want us to suggest, what is our measure of success that we're talking about here? Is the measure of success that we have contained the number of positive cases or that we have adequately addressed the communities that are the most affected um, in Nassau and Suffolk County? So I will leave it there and I uh, look forward to hearing the rest of my uh, panelists. Great. Great, powerful questions, real, real legitimate ones that we're going to have to fight to, to answer. Um, Kathleen Blaney, you have uh, gotten to be a little bit of the brains to help uh, steer New York's contact testing. Um, probably uh, coming on the heels of, as I was thinking of the job description that Professor Hackett uh, displayed, I thought coming on the heels of doing the HIV contact testing, which had to be probably the most sensitive of sensitive types of testing. Um, but you have a, a, a large chore ahead because now we have a whole community uh, at risk and uh, we're trying to uh, move forward. Your thoughts? Absolutely. I actually wish that I didn't have slides and that we could delve right into Dr. Hackett's questions because I think she raised some really interesting um, points for a conversation. So um, I will try to be kind of brief in the slides that I have here. Um, but I think it's important just to kind of level set, make sure we all are on the same page about what contact tracing is, recognizing, of course, that there could be differences between New York City and New York State, as well as other regions. I'm from Wisconsin. I can tell you um, that this is going to look a little bit different in the context of a more rural community than it is going to look in, in New York City. So um, we could just get started on the slides then, I think. 
Uh, so I, I think Dr. Hackett raised a good point in terms of what is the goal of contact tracing? Is the goal to identify every single positive case and all of their contacts, or is it more to just interrupt uh, chains of transmission? And I'm going to make a strong argument for the latter as we go through. Um, and the way we're going to try and do this is through case investigation and contact tracing. I think it's also important to acknowledge that this is going to be one of the largest scales that an endeavor of this ha um, has been undertaken. Um, we've certainly learned really important lessons in uh, smallpox and Ebola, um, HIV. I think the example of tuberculosis is an excellent one. Um, a colleague of mine here on this team has been working very closely on, um, or had, um, is working very closely on this project, but spent the majority of her early career doing the tuberculosis contact tracing um, and has been just a wealth of wisdom. Um, and I also just wanted to acknowledge the really the collaborative effort that this is not just among, um, you know, the health department and city agencies and state agencies, but really it's, uh, it's going to sound corny, but I mean, we've all been for this, these last four months really suffering something quite unprecedented together. And it's because of the incredible measures that we've taken as a community in terms of our social distancing that we've been able to make it to this point. So I just wanna acknowledge that and then acknowledge the fact that this contact tracing and case investigations um, are gonna be continue to be a communal effort. Next slide. Um, I assume many of you in the public health world have seen um, this uh, in some form before, but just to kind of uh, orient us to where we are in this outbreak. Um, if we look all the way to the left, we can see that this preparedness stage here was um, pre-December 2019. Uh, in, in some ways, it was a simpler time. Uh, hard to believe it was only six or seven months ago when we first started seeing those sporadic cases or clusters of cases in December um, through January, February, March, and then in March in New York City and in, in the state, we reached this, this phase of mitigation where not only did we have local transmission, but also widespread transmission. And where we see ourselves now, um, and of course different parts of the state have reached these milestones at different times, is in this uh, period of declining transmission. And um, this period of declining transmission is really what's allowing us to enter into this um, suppression and, and contact tracing phase. If we had tried to do contact tracing in March, you know, there's, there's no way we could have been able to keep up with the number of cases and exposed persons. So um, I also just want to acknowledge, and I'm sure all of you who are familiar to public health are aware of the fact that this suppression phase is going to be bumpy. Um, as we kind of do this phase reopening approach, we are going to see small resurgences of cases, um, and that's to be expected as we lift these social distancing measures. Um, but we, it's going to be a long path, but uh, we're hopefully on, um, moving forward in the right direction. Next slide. Um, again, just to orient us, so just uh, in terms of vocabulary that we're using, uh, a case for in the context of um, Contact tracing is a case is a confirmed case, someone who has a positive lab test. And um, when I say a positive lab test, I mean a positive PCR um, swab, not an antibody test. And then we also have probable cases. And probable cases are people um, who have been exposed who have a symptom of COVID-19. And then that felt dramatic. Um, when we think about contacts, we have contacts who are household members, uh, intimate partners, um, individuals providing care in the household, including um, home health care workers and or domestic workers. And then this, um, this, I, this concept of a close contact being someone you've been um, in closer proximity than six feet to for over 10 minutes. And I think, um, you know, it's this definition and this um, uh, method of tracing that, that's a little bit harder to um, unpack and uncover. So I'll go into that a little bit later. Next slide, please. I also just wanted to make, take a brief moment to make the distinction between isolation and quarantine. So isolation is the separation of sick people um, from people who are not sick. So cases isolate. Um, and then quarantine is the separation of people who've been exposed to um, a contagious disease to see if they become sick. Um, so uh, contacts, quarantine. So cases isolate, contacts, quarantine. I think um, we sometimes use that language interchangeably when we're um, like listening to the news or um, speaking colloquially. Um, so I just wanna make that distinction. Next slide. 
So finally, what is the New York City Test and Trace Corps? So um, the New York City Test and Trace Corps is an initiative by New York City and New York City Health and Hospitals. Um, it's a three-pronged approach to stopping COVID-19 in New York City. So um, it's test, trace, and take care. Um, and I think uh, once we go through the tracing component, which is the part that I'm most intimately acquainted with, I'd like us to discuss the take care, especially with regards to some of the um, questions and really great points that Dr. Hackett made. So um, again, part of the reason we're able to enter into the suppression phase is because we have a robust testing mechanism um, or capacity to do some, some uh, really high level amount of testing. Um, and then this contact tracing is really focused on identifying cases, tracing their contacts, and recommending that those uh, cases and contacts either isolate or quarantine for the appropriate period of time to make sure that we are not spreading um, COVID to other individuals. And then the take care component is this uh, piece where everyone who is identified as a case or a contact is offered social and supportive services um, to make them successful in their isolation and their quarantine periods. Next slide. Great. Um, so this diagram is of a hypothetical illness that has an R naught of two. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Contagion, Kate Winslet does a really uh, excellent job uh, defining what an R naught is, but the R naught is a reproductive value of a virus. So in this, again, hypothetical instance, um, the R naught is two, which means that two people get infected for every single case. So um, if you start with a single case, after three generations, you'll see eight cases of COVID. And if you go to the next slide, I just wanna illustrate that if you can break the chain of transmission by isolating and quarantining, even if just by 50%, um, by the time you get down to this third generation, instead of having eight infected individuals, um, you will only have one. And so the concept of contact tracing and isolating and quarantining is really built on this idea that if we can break even a few chains of transmission, we're gonna do a lot of good in, in stopping the spread of um, diseases like COVID-19. Next slide. Uh, so where are we now? So um, New York City launched its contact tracing program uh, last Monday. So we are a week and a half in. Um, I apologize to um, Senator Hannon and Tony who caught me, I think, in the midst of one of the busier weeks of my uh, professional life. Um, but we are uh, beginning to see how this program is going to look on a, in a scale um, in a city the size of New York. Um, and we are, we are doing this uh, in unique circumstances in that most of our staff is working remotely for the same concerns we cite for any of us working um, outside of the home. So uh, I also want to acknowledge that this tracing program is going to evolve with the outbreak. Um, the tasks and protocols are going to change depending on what the data show and what the case counts are. Um, and that we welcome continued input. And, um, you know, the more we know and learn about COVID-19, the more we um, you know, the, the, our understanding of the virus is changing every day, so it's important that we be flexible to adapting to those um, the new pieces of information. And the other thing I want to just highlight is this isn't going to be perfect. Um, I think one thing we've all been struggling with is uh, wanting to be an A student, um, coming to the understanding that we are not always going to be successful in reaching every case and every contact. But if you go back to that diagram of the R0, um, to the extent that we're able to um, you know, stop trans trains of transmission in any capacity will be successful in stopping the spread and really help, uh, helping to open New York City, reopen New York City. Next slide. Um, so I just want to get back to something I believe Dr. Hackett said um, about how we identify uh, the cases. So um, uh, COVID-19 is a reportable disease, so the lab tests performed in New York City are automatically reported to the New York City Health Department. Um, and every person who tests positive then is automatically enrolled in the TRACE program. Um, and because we TRACE already investigates cases that are reported to the Health Department, we are not um, collecting reports from the public uh, at this time. Next slide, please. So how do we identify contacts? So once we identify a case, one of our uh, case investigators will reach out to someone who has been recently diagnosed and conduct an interview, in which case 
um, we elicit their contacts um, and their contacts are enrolled in the TRACE program. Um, with more access to testing, people who believe they've been exposed um, but have not been contacted by our program should consider going and getting tested and self-quarantining. Um, and then if they do have a positive result, they will be enrolled in the program as well. Next slide. And so I just want to quickly identify what the four roles on our team are. Um, we have a case investigator who is someone who conducts interviews with people who are newly diagnosed with COVID-19 and asks about their contacts. Um, we have monitors who follow up with cases and contacts who have been identified for 10 to 14 days and whose job is really to assess cases and contacts needs during their isolation and quarantine periods. And I'll, I'll get into this in a little bit more detail in just a minute. Um, but it's not just their physical needs, it's also kind of what supportive services that they might need to be successful um, throughout this 10 to 14 day period. We also have information gatherers who use various resources to find additional contact information for cases and contacts. Um, we know that clinicians are uh, very bright people, but sometimes paperwork leaves a little bit to be desired. So about 20% of all the case information that we receive um, at the health department and as part of the, the TRACE program um, is incomplete in terms of having uh, contact information. So um, we have a team who are specially trained to um, reach out to those doctor's offices and the labs to, to um, follow up on um, getting the right information to be able to contact folks. And then we also have community engages specialists who will be going out into the community um, to help assess uh, uh, cases and contacts for whom we might have address information but not phone numbers. Next slide, please. Um, so what do we do for cases? So when we um, first identify a case, we call them. Um, ideally, they will have uh, learned of their test result by the time they're in contact with our team. Um, and we really provide an education about what COVID-19 is and about their diagnosis. Um, and then for 10 to 14 days, we monitor them for new or worsening illness. Um, and that's a really important um, a really important aspect of the job because we, we've seen, uh, especially in, in folks who seem maybe either asymptomatic or who seem sick but not too sick, we, we know this um, concept of the um, silent hypoxia or the happy hypoxemics who, um, you know, maybe aren't demonstrably symptomatic but have pulse oxes lower than 90 degree, 90 percent. Um, and so we want to encourage them to seek medical care uh, in, in recognizing that someone might be doing well on day three or four, but get progressively sister, sicker throughout the course of their, um, their illness. Uh, we also help them identify their contacts so that we can um, reach out to those contacts and we do not name the case when we reach those contacts, but we tell those contacts they have been exposed and recommend quarantine and, and um, I'll get into that in a minute. We also recommend and support isolation for cases, evaluate their need for supportive services, and then inform them when their period of isolation can end. And that is uh, dependent on their date of symptom onset. Next slide, please. And then we do very similar work for contacts. So we educate them about COVID-19 and their exposure. We monitor them for new or worsening illness. Um, and if someone who is a contact indicates that they have become symptomatic, we recommend that they get tested. Um, we recommend and support quarantine. We again, evaluate need for supportive services and then inform them when they can end quarantine. Next slide. And so this is just the workflow, um, really reiterating what I already said, um, except to say that when we do the case investigation, we also collect demographic information. Um, and this can be on uh, someone's race, ethnicity, their gender identity, sexual orientation, um, you know, their geographic location, so that we can help identify pockets that might be disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, so we confirm that the, the case lives in New York City, assess their symptoms, uh, collect information on their contacts, recommend isolation, and then next slide, please. Assess their need for supportive services, ask monitoring preference, enroll in daily monitoring, and complete the interview. And when I say ask monitoring preference, I just wanna flag that right now we are calling all cases, but we are hoping to move to um, a text-based platform in the near future, so that would be an option for people who prepare to be, or prefer to be contacted that way. And then next slide. 
Um, the workflow for contacts is very similar. We confirm a contact's identity, again, collect demographic information, confirm that they reside in the city. Um, we assess for their symptoms and underlying medical conditions, recommend quarantine, and then assess their need for supportive services. Right. You'll also ask the contacts their monitoring preference, enroll them in daily monitoring, discuss testing, and then complete the interview. So I just want to take a second to highlight what our team's kind of mission is. Um, you know, as I think Dr. Hackett said, and I think we can all agree, uh, the last three months have been traumatizing for many, many New Yorkers for a lot of really understandable reasons. Um, this has been very scary. Our lives have been impacted. Our economic stability has been affected. We've lost family members. We've lost friends and coworkers. And it's really, really difficult. So, um, you know, we, in, as part of our orientation for all of our staff, um, it's a five-day training where we discuss things like um, trauma-informed care um, and really, uh, in, really instill in our staff the importance of protecting and maintaining individual privacy and, convention, and confidentiality, um, the importance of communicating in a clear and professional and compassionate manner. Uh, we ensure that the engagement that our staff have with both cases and contacts is respectful and informed by culture, humility, gender identity, and expression awareness, and with a really strong baseline understanding in health inequities. Um, we ensure that services are provided for all New Yorkers, regardless of their immigration status, their language or identities. And we promote safe and equitable practices for our staff um, and understand and support populations who might be at higher risk of COVID-19 and its complications for any number of factors or any number of reasons. And then these are just um, some additional resources on COVID-19 that I um, will leave up on the screen for a second, but. Uh, don't have to do too much explanation for, I don't think. Well, that's great. Um, let's go to Senator Balboni. Um, Michael, you have been working with uh, any number of institutions involving uh, COVID right now, in com companies willing or worried about opening, and also some of the nursing homes that have been uh, dealing with a uh, population uh, living in congregate uh, living st status and susceptible to uh, COVID. Um, give us your thoughts as to where you are, and especially with some of the changes that have just come about in the last 10 hours. Sure. So um, I get a chance to work with a bunch of different organizations. Some of them are like sports arenas, um, worldwide financial institutions, um, local companies that uh, are trying to decide what the new workplace looks like, both in the city and on Long Island. And then also, um, as you said before, healthcare facilities, specifically nursing homes. And what everybody's being forced to do right now is to reimagine what the future is going to look like. You know, the New York Times had a May 4th article, I thought it was fascinating. It said, you know, and does the new workplace mean the end to the New York Times and the way they have an open floor plan? And that really is a question for everybody. As you recall, you know, when Mayor Bloomberg was in the mayor's office, he was uh, famous for the pit. Well, the pit doesn't exist anymore in this new day and age. What's really perplexing everybody, though, is the, is the kind of the back end. All of the presenters have given basically a 101 on contact tracing and have explained it very, very well. There is one element, though, that I wish we could just explore a little bit more, and that is the intersection of fear and privacy. You know, one of the things that uh, we're going to have to struggle with is, are people going to comply with this? You know, at the at the end, what's the last piece of a contact tracing um, script is, you know, a recommended iso you know, quarantine and isolation. That's recommended. So it's not required. And this is going to become a huge issue as we move forward in the labor law. You know, we're, we are watching what OSHA is going to say about what the new workplace rules are going to be. Nothing has come out yet for that. We're going to wonder in terms of labor management relations. Will a submission to a contact tracing or to an antibody test, or at least a temperature check, be a term and condition of employment? You know, what are the ways that, that you're going to try to monitor your workplace if someone does come in and then begins to uh, exhibit symptoms? What are their privacy rights? And these, these things are, you know, we don't have a playbook for this. 
you know, I know that the contact tracing has been used <clears throat> throughout an epidemiological study in history, whether it's measles or other types of chemical diseases. But I believe this is the first time we've had a modern era global pandemic where we've really dug into this. And what's so important is that we give people confidence that the environment in which they are going to enter is in fact safe. We were talking before with the panelists before we began about, so what is the goal of all of these health surveillance initiatives? Is it to try to determine how the disease is transmitted? So as to try to prevent strategy, to develop strategy to prevent it from happening? Is it to create a COVID-free environment, almost guaranteeing the safety of everybody who walks in there? You know, that, I assure you, that last standard is something that no employer is willing to accept or is going to be ready to accept, frankly, given uh, the paucity of rules and regulations. Now, so I've been dealing with uh, the governor's office on reopening. We've had a lot of very granular discussions as to what plans can be acceptable. And in fact, I think the governor has done a very good job in laying out some of the specific requirements that you need to be able to demonstrate for a workplace. But these are gonna evolve because I think that, that all the panelists will agree that this is a disease that we're still learning about. We, we don't know all the things that are gonna happen now as we get into this new stage. You know, is this a, in, in, the, in the life of a pandemic, obviously you have different stages and you know, are we in a stage where the disease is going to go dormant? Are we in a second surge? Is there going to be something in the fall? And particularly for nursing homes, this is a huge challenge, not just in terms of trying to anticipate what we need to do to prepare for the next instance, but also how do we work at staffing, you know, uh, uh, personal protective equipment, um, cohorting these patients, bed capacity, not just for the hospitals, but for nursing homes and assisted livings as well. And then long-term- Define cohorting. Sorry, cohorting is the ability to isolate within a room or a setting a uh, limited number of patients in such a way that you prevent, uh, you basically make it hygienic to use a, a, a word of common parlance. Um, you know, and then the, the, here's the big, the big question for nursing homes. Is congregate care, in other words, putting people together in one facility and taking care of them long term, is that a possibility in the future? And I, you know, some of the studies that, that I've seen out of South Korea are absolutely fascinating that really rely a lot on airflow and in terms of a transmission agent. So how is that going to change the way we live in this new COVID age? We have, we're ending up with more questions, obviously, than we have answers. But in a set of situations where there are real no answers, we're really addressing uh, something that's been introduced. And as uh, Kathleen Blaney was going through the stages, the elaborate stages they're going to do for contact testing, I was thinking, what's, what's the result, the, the success? Um, you know, what, what's the percentage? And I think it's more analogous to someone who's a good baseball player and a batting average of three, 300, 333 is considered outstanding. As we go through this whole process, if we can find out to, that some way to cut down that rate of retransmission or transmission um, and have that lower than one, then we're successful. But um, you, you can't, it, it's, you're not gonna be able to test everybody. You're not gonna be able to have total assurance. Uh, the question was, how do we, exactly the questions you raised, Michael, um, how do you introduce the changes that you're gonna have to come about? There was a great story in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about various hospitals that are already changing around how they interact with their uh, patients and potential patients. People can't come in directly, they have to submit information by uh, mobile phone. Uh, when, they're, when they're going to be uh, seen, there's stages of uh, an emergency room or admittance room that uh, allow people to be screened as they come in. Even the questions of how do you go through um, taking care of someone uh, who's in an ICU? Do you have to have somebody go into their room, the patient's room as much as they usually do, or can much of it be done from outside? building different rooms in regard to positive airflow and negative airflow. So 
it's that was that was just obviously the most immediate because that's where the immediate uh, need was. But uh, how we go through in terms of uh, large institutions, that's um, Professor Gallo. That's that's what we're 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 looking to all of the ways you've worked through um, uh, the, the challenges that come through for a thirteen thousand uh, people campus. Uh, that's going to be a difficult thing. Yeah, it will be. I think surveillance is very important. It's one thing, whatever the guidance is around the initial um, opening in terms of testing and then finding your positives and, um, you know, doing con contact tracing. Um, but I think overall, what will keep me up at night certainly is you don't want little hot spots to start up and you not know about it. So there's certain populations on campus that will be tested more than um surveillance say so your athletes so Hofstra has a very robust athletic program so right now i'm working with the medical director um, of athletics he's on uh, a group nationwide to figure out what do you do around the athletes um dr fauci was interviewed for the chronicle of higher education and um his comment was that um, yeah, he, he, very gray about certain um, questions, but he, was, he wasn't when it came to the athletes in terms of having them tested regularly. What regularly is, we don't know yet, mm -hmm. but that's a group that to keep an eye on. So, so I think surveillance um, is key after we figure out what we do initially with everybody. Um, what should the surveillance be? Yeah, so we will have to model out what, what number, uh, what sample population that we take at a certain point in time. We haven't modeled that out yet. Um, and that has to be you know, a broad sample to include not only um, students, but students, faculty, et cetera. Um, I'd be curious if Kathleen had any um, insight on surveillance in terms of models. Um, I know Dr. Fauci in his interview really couldn't be specific. His location is different across the country. And the anticipation is that what they do in one area of the country won't be the same. There's no size fits all. Um, so all that will still need to be modeled out. Yeah, I, I just to respond to that, you're exactly right. And I think, um, you know, it, this we were entering this um, in New York City phase one reopening. And I think the extent that um, this reopening is going to impact our, our numbers is, is really obviously what's going to drive um, what the, the next few months look like and when we can look forward to phase two. And um, we certainly are trying to stay on top of the models, but uh, things are, are going to change. And I think, you know, after the last the events of the last week and, um, you know, we see people in larger crowds coming together in a way we haven't in a long time. And, and certainly that will have some impact, the extent to which it will has yet to be seen. Um, but yeah. It, yeah. You know, and um, we need, you know, we need to always remember the basics in terms of uh, social distancing, Wearing masks, you know, the infection rate in the healthcare providers that were taking care of COVID patients are less than the uh, community. We know PPE works. Washing your hands, washing your hands, washing your hands. Um, so we have to continue to remind people about the basics, the stuff that's not very complicated. Maybe a little inconvenient, but not complicated. And then I have to put a plug in for the flu shots. Because when the flu shows up, if we're battling both the COVID and the flu, it will just be more complicated. We will go on a big marketing campaign at Hofstra. Uh, and we will, be, we will provide flu shots for anybody that, um, that is looking for one. Because um, that is something that um, we need to pay attention to to help prevent battling two things at the same time. Yes, one of the one of the things that strikes me also is paying attention to um, the 
black community, especially mm -hmm. black males. Um, it's been said that the, the, uh, if you're a minority, you had COVID greater uh, than whites. But I also note that males have COVID greater than females. And my experience has been in regard to black males that it's a uh, community that distrusts uh, the medical establishment. And I went through this personally as a senator um, where we would um, try to do health fairs, we would try to do health presentations. Um, I started with um, doing prostate testing um, at, at, and at the beginning, and I would do it in uh, the black communities in my district, um, Hempstead, uh, Uniondale, and it was very lightly attended, worked with the uh, churches and the pastors, mm -hmm. Um, so that towards the last few health fairs we had for prostate testing, we had a packed house because we had proven to um, the, 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 the potential patients, the, the people to be tested, that we're on the up and up, that this was a legitimate thing, that it gave them good information. Um, I was struck one day, we're uh, making a presentation at a church, and uh, the man in the audience said, uh, thank you, Hannon. You saved my life because of the testing. But it, it brings out to me that we have much work to do in regard to confidence into the community. Um, I know that Governor Cuomo in, uh, enlisted and at Northwell uh, to do testing in many of the black churches. I think that has to be a building block uh, to, to move forward. Um, there's lots of other building blocks to move forward. Um, but it strikes me as that's one of the things that we have to do, especially as uh, we're in, in, in the results of uh, George Floyd's murder um, and, and to go forward. Yeah, Northwell is in 20 churches right now doing testing. Um, you know, uh, our um, Department of Community Affairs is leading that effort. One of the other things that strikes me is the questions that Professor Hacker, you raised as to what, what happens when you say, say to somebody, you really should isolate yourself. And where do you go isolating? But there was a, there was a story this morning about uh, the advocates for the homeless were pushing the city to come up with, you need to do better for those who are homeless because they are most at risk for COVID. And towards the end of the story, there was an amazing statistic as to what the city has already done. They found 10,000 uh, places in hotels and single uh, occupancy rooms, 10,000 since this has, this, uh, the, the pandemic has begun. I thought that was an amazing uh, thing to, for somebody to have accomplished and little renowned uh, about it at all. But I also think it strikes very hard. Where, where can you go if you're supposed to isolate, you don't have a place to go? That's, that's gonna be the next series of stories that we're gonna face as, as all of the, your, uh, Kathleen Blaney, all of your, your, your uh, testers are, are working their way forward. And as you, as you said, as you try to figure out what uh, type of course corrections you're gonna have to make. Absolutely. Um, Sorry, I didn't cut you off. Go ahead. No, and I just wanted to comment on that um, because I, I didn't get into too much detail about the take care component of our, our three pillar program. So um, the take care really is um, when we're doing both that initial investigation for both a case and a contact, we ask people who are either cases or who've been exposed what their needs for wraparound services are. And one of those wraparound services is a hotel room. So that is one of the avenues into the hoteling program. Um, we also ask uh, upon every monitoring encounter if anyone's needs for wraparound services have changed, recognizing that if someone maybe doesn't need food on day one or day two by day 14, if they haven't been working, if they haven't been able to leave the house, um, those needs are gonna look a lot different. So. Um, um, that is, I think, a critical component of the contact tracing program. And I think, um, you know, really one of the more exciting things we're able to do for people to help them be successful, because ultimately, if people are successful and they're isolating and quarantining, 
you know, is, is the only way that the contact tracing program itself is going to be successful. Um, I also want to respond to something you said about the congregate settings and um, recognizing, of course, that congregate settings could look very different across the board. So, you know, nursing homes are congregate settings. The assisted living facilities um, are going to look different than homeless shelters and um, correctional facilities. And um, we have a team um, that is working specifically with congregate care sites to both help with those investigations and to offer a, a more um, specific or uh, detailed approach to infection prevention and control in, in those sites. And that is done by a group here at the health department. More, more power to you. Um, Professor Hackett, you have been relatively silent. I know, um, unusual, but I think that um, I applaud the work at the New York City Department of Health is doing and uh, health and hospitals to be able to have those wraparound services, which I think are absolutely vital. Uh, and I challenge uh, Nassau and Suffolk County to be able to um, at least meet that minimum standard. Um, again, just, you know, thinking about the, you know, recognition that if we are to be successful, people need to be able to, to, to follow the directions and they need the, the tools to be able to do so. And so I um, have yet to see that in Nassau and Suffolk County. Uh, and I would also suggest that the services that are available here, um, even before the pandemic, were um, the, the safety net was thin. And so, you know, mm -hmm. for us to now in this um, uh, uh, new uh, COVID-19 world to be able to sort of provide these services, again, recognizing that um, the communities of color in Nassau and Suffolk County, which by the way, Nassau had four, the, is the fourth leading county in the country in terms of positive cases and deaths. And so this is not like some, you know, suburban area that's just like, you know, has a few cases, you know, this is a very serious issue. And when it comes to the actual communities that were affected, we know, we know what those communities are. And here's where we need to anticipate what to do. We could not have anticipated the pandemic, but we could have anticipated who it was going to affect disproportionately. And so in, by not providing, you know, and so for example, the, um, uh, when testing was available, it was available at Jones Beach, where uh, in Nassau County, which is great, but also is a barrier to many people uh, in those affected communities to be able to get testing. And so um, it was weeks and weeks in Nassau County before testing was available in walk-in sites within those communities. And so I, I'm concerned Concerned, to be honest, in terms of where we are going to be able to not just sort of check off a box that we have enough contact tracers, but what is the depth of their training and their experience and how committed are they um, to be able to provide that sense of a wraparound service so that they can be successful. Great, great. I, I, think, I think we could, uh, in a sense, draw it to a close, but I don't want to uh, cut off anybody, any further comments by Anybody on the panel? There are there are some questions in there, but they are basically uh, questions more about um, what is the role of taking temperature and how valuable it is. It how is the transmission of the uh, the virus? Some of these things are more general and um, need to be addressed. But in terms of reopening, I don't know that uh, they're the ones that uh, we should need to address today. But um, Kathleen Blaney. Martine Hackett, Michael Balboni, Kathleen Gallo, any further comments? Oh, good. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you for thank all you. of the information. Obviously, this is, we're in the middle of a crisis, but uh, you're, we're in a new part of the journey in that crisis, and uh, we look forward to addressing it in the future. And thank you all for joining with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.